we do not obtain right standing before God based on anything that we can do, but based on what Christ has already done. You see, every religion on earth teaches that in order to be made right with God, you must practice certain things while at the same time abstaining from other things in order to be made right with God. Christianity, however, is altogether different in that it teaches that in order to be made right with God, it is nothing that we do on our own, but it is what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. Today we are back in the book of Mark, a study that began seven or eight months ago. And we're looking at the middle of chapter seven at verses 14 through 23. The title of the sermon this morning, for those of you who are taking notes, is the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. William Barclay calls this text the most revolutionary passage in all of the New Testament. And the theme of the text is that our corruption is not something outside of us, something that is external, but something deeply rooted inside of us, something that is internal. In other words, the corruption of the heart does not come from worldliness, saints, but listen to me, worldliness comes from the corruption of our hearts. That is different than most modern day psychologists and philosophers that would tell you that mankind is inherently good. I'm teaching a class this semester, and this will be my last semester to teach based on the way it's gone in Northwest, a philosophy class. And all 25 of my students believe that mankind is inherently good. The Bible teaches something altogether different. That we are, in fact, wicked And we are totally depraved. This passage is a unique passage. It is not a passage that is going to be go and do these things. This is really, listen, we we preached the book of Judges. And so, you know, that was not a K-Love sermon series. It was not positive and encouraging. I got news for you. Today's sermon is not going to be positive and encouraging. But what we're going to see is what really defiles us. And that it's not something that is outside of us and something that is external, but something that is innate inside of us that is there because of the fall and the result of Adam's sin. Because through Adam, all men die. David says that in sin did his mother conceive him. That means that he was sinful by birth. In other words, there is something wicked about our hearts. But the hope of the gospel this morning is that Jesus came to give us a new heart. And we can all rejoice together in that. So let's take a moment. Let's set up the context of this passage. This book, the book of Mark, was written by John Mark. He wrote it from Peter's perspective, which is going to be significant in a moment when when Jesus declares all foods being clean. Because Peter in Acts 10 is the one who saw the sheet fall where Jesus was declaring all foods clean once again to his apostles in order that they might take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so John Mark pens these words. John Mark primarily writes this book to show us what it looks like to be a disciple, what it looks like to know and follow Jesus. And in the previous text, Stephen preached last week, beginning in chapter 7, we see this this concept that that they're, they're honoring God with their mouths. They're doing all these religious rituals. They're adding to the ceremonial law in order to feel better about themselves. And what they failed to recognize in the previous text that Jesus is going to address in the text before us today is that the ceremonial law was never meant to make them feel good about themselves, but to show them that God was completely holy and they were wicked and they were sinful. They failed to see what the ceremonial law pointed them to. That the requirements in Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy weren't there to make them feel better about themselves but they were there to show them their need to be saved, to reveal the impurity, the defilement of their own hearts. And so that is the context in which we pick up 
today. There's a huge crowd gathered. And in front of the crowd, the Pharisees and the scribes are still there, always looking for a way to capture Jesus in some violation so they could get an indictment against him to have him killed. And in verse 14, the crowd has reconvened. And Jesus is directing his conversation at them. Whereas verses 1 through 13, where he was primarily talking to scribes and Pharisees. And so we're going to pick up then in verse 14 of chapter 7. And if you are physically able this morning, I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant, life-giving word. It says, and he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then you are also without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you that we have access to you through his blood. And I pray that, God, as we look at the truth of your word this morning, God, I pray that you would use these truths. God, not to simply correct our actions, but God, to reveal the wickedness of our hearts. God, I pray for those that have come through the doors, God, who have never repented of sin and trusted in Christ, I pray that you would show them, God, their need for a Savior and their need to be given a new heart. God, I pray for those that are born again believers that are struggling with sin. God, I pray that we would not misplace the blame of that sin and put it on the world around us, but God, that we would recognize that it's something that wells up from within us as our hearts continue to make new idols. And so, God, I pray that you would convict us. God, that you would shape us. God, we know that the shaping of a believer is not a comfortable thing, but God, I pray that during this time, as your word is preached, I pray that you would do that in our hearts. And God, I pray above everything else that Christ would be magnified. God, that you would be lifted high. And so God, work in our midst. We love and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There are three overarching lessons that we're going to pull from this text. It's a very, it was a very difficult text for me to outline and work through. And so if my points are a little bit lengthy this morning, I apologize on the front end. But the first lesson that we learn in the text is that our defilement does not come from the world around us, but from the wickedness of our hearts within us. Let's go back to the text and let's see what it says in verses 14 and 15. And he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me all of you and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Now, the context is this. In the previous passage, the disciples came together. They were getting ready to eat bread. They did not ceremonially wash their hands before eating the bread. The Pharisees, who do a really good job of looking at the flaws in others, see the disciples not doing this, and they highlight this to Jesus. They tell him, your disciples are not following the law. They're not washing their hands. Jesus essentially tells them, hey, they don't have to follow the law because this is man-made regulations to begin with. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And so what Jesus goes on to say in verses 14 and 15 is absolutely radical. Now listen, we need to take our minds from where we are today back to the context. And remember the first century context of this passage. The Old Testament made a clear distinction between the clean and the unclean. The external uncleanness was always a picture meant to teach God's people about the separation of God from sin. That was the whole point of this this idea of, of clean and unclean. And so at a fundamental level, For those of you doing your reading plans and you're in the Old Testament right now, you're probably wrapping up the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
at a fundamental level, those three books are catechizing books in that they're constantly teaching God's people that, that, that mankind is unclean and God is holy. Those, those ceremonial cleansings, those rituals, those things were supposed to teach man that they in and of themselves were not clean. And they needed to be clean to be in order, or, or, sorry, in order to be in God's presence. You see, there's no, no aspect of life that's untouched by God's holiness. And there's no aspect of life at the same time that is untouched by man's sinfulness. And so the distinction between the holy and the unholy were not a, uh, uh, sorry, they, they were a reminder to God's people that God was holy and he was meant to be treated as such. And so the ceremonial law was a reminder to God's people that they were to be distinct from the world around them. This goes even to their dietary laws as God's people. And so the imagery then made clear a distinction between God's people and the surrounding nation. And so this system then was observed for centuries. And then all of a sudden, I want you to picture this with me, you're immersed in this as a Jew. Right? You're, you're doing all these rituals. You're, 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 you're constantly having to observe feasts and festivals. And then and you're observing this dietary law. You're not even eating barbecue or pork. And then all of a sudden, this teacher comes along, this rabbi. And what he says in this text is absolutely radical. It reshapes their worldview. You see, the differentiation between the clean and the unclean is redefined from what goes into the body all of a sudden to what comes out of the heart. Jesus teaches here that the problem is not what goes into our stomachs, but what springs up out of the well of our hearts. Saints, I want you to know this morning, it's easy to follow a list. It's easy for us to say, don't do this don't do that. Listen, I grew up in the 90s. I'm getting a little ahead of my sermon. I grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, all right? That was youth group days for me, right? I mean, don't do these things. While very little explanation was ever given to me as to why we don't do these things. You can even throw in the list of things to abstain from. So do these things, don't do these things. Avoid these things, make sure you do these things. And here comes Jesus and what he teaches is something profoundly different. You see, the legalists, the, the Pharisees at this point in time, they would argue that you could contribute to your salvation or at the very least that you could contribute to your own personal holiness by something good in you. The gospel of Jesus doesn't say do more in order to accomplish salvation. It actually highlights what Christ has done for you, showing you that you couldn't obtain it on your own. You see, the problem with man is not the pollution from the outside that's waging war. It's the war going on that's being waged inside of our hearts. That means this morning it is entirely possible for you to come through the doors of the church and for everything to look clean on the outside. It is entirely possible for you to come to the doors and to even use Christian language and identify with the body of Christ for you to say certain things and, 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 and act in a certain way. While in actuality, your heart could be far from God on the inside. Church, that is the danger of legalism. It says that you can look a certain way, act a certain way, while at the same time being lost. I mean, look inside the band of disciples themselves. Judas walked with Jesus. Judas spent time with Jesus. Judas saw the same miracles. He heard the same proclamations that the other 11 disciples heard, and yet his heart was never born again. I remember growing up and thinking about this works-based kind of thing is like pedals on a bike that I've got to continue doing these things and I have to do and do and do and do. And it was, it was not only revolutionary to me, it was freeing and liberating to me to really begin to understand the grace of God. You see, the real issue is not the things the world is preoccupied with around us. The real issue is the sin that proceeds from within us. I've even sat with people as, as born-again Christians may 
outlandish statements. Things like, the devil made me do it. Have you ever heard that? The devil made me do it. It sounds a lot like blame shifting, right? I talk to my kids all the time about taking ownership of mistakes they make, right? Manhood is about taking ownership. You say, hey, I blew it. I messed up. I shouldn't have done this, right? Take ownership. Take responsibility. The devil made me do it is not taking responsibility. Or I've even heard the old devil sure is tempting me recently. And listen, while I agree that Satan is seeking to devour you, he does not need cleverly devised plans in order to do that. All he really needs is a window into your heart. He needs a window into your heart. You see, Satan is not the one leading you into sin. We do a pretty good job of that on our own. Now, Satan might capitalize on our struggles, but he does not make us or cause us to do anything, listen to me, that we do not already want to do. Listen to what James says in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. Well, let the Bible speak in this area. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But listen to what James says in verse 14 about how temptation is conceived and how it gives birth. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? Does anybody know it? His own desires. Each man is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, verse 15, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You know what James didn't mention in that passage? Satan. You see, sometimes we need to take a good long look in the mirror to see who our greatest enemy really is. Because it's ourselves. The fundamental problem of humanity is not what we do, but who we are. Because what we do is merely a reflection of the condition of our hearts. Saints, I would argue that the greatest threat to your personal holiness is not the world around you, but your very own heart within you. And until you guard your heart, until you're honest with yourself about the condition of your heart, you cannot pursue personal holiness because no amount of abstaining will make you holy, especially if you're abstaining in order to please God, just to be made right with him. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 says this, as, there, as Jesse's just parading out his sons, and with each son, Samuel thinks, well, this is going to be the king. This is going to be the one who's going to take the crown. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Saints, I want you to know this. Regardless of what your outward actions have looked like this past week, month, or year, Jesus sees you. That is a frightening, frightening thing for us. But he sees us. You know why King David was even being selected here anyway? Because, San, because King Saul had taken the Amalekites. He had wiped out the Amalekites and he was supposed to wipe out every animal as well. And when, and when Samuel showed up, he has a conversation with with King Saul. And in the middle of that conversation, he hears the bleeding of sheep in the background. And he says, but Saul, why are, there, why are there sheep bleeding in the background? Were you not told to wipe all of the Amalekites out as well as their livestock? And, and King Saul says, well, listen, I was gonna take and I was gonna offer some of these, some of these herds to God as a sacrifice. I was going to do some of these rituals. I was going to, to have some religious activity attached to this. And Samuel looks at Saul and he tell, calls him a fool. And he says, God is not interested in your sacrifice. God is interested in your heart. He's interested in you. You see, biblical principles of external defilement are laid out in the scriptures. But they were never meant to be divorced from the heart. Ceremonial purity was meant to be evidence of saving faith, not the source of saving faith. 
Moses made it clear in Deuteronomy that God wanted obedience and adherence to the law, but not so they could be made right with God, but from a heart that already loved and treasured God above all things. And so here, Jesus is not setting aside the moral law of God. He is, however, destroying the notion that one can make themselves more holy by adding to the law of God. You see, the Pharisees' God was outward performance, not a God who transforms the hearts. And that leads us to the second lesson that we learn from the text. I want you to see that our understanding is hindered by religious rituals when we fail to see what they are pointing to. Our understanding is hindered by religious rituals when we fail to see what they are pointing to. Look at the text of verses 17, 18, and even 19. It says, and when he had entered the house, so after they left the crowd there, he left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. I mean, don't you love it when you're sitting in class and you have no clue what the teacher's saying, but you don't want to be the foolish one to raise your hand and say, what are you saying right now? Can you stop and explain that to me A little more thorough. Listen, I was never the guy that raised his hand in class. I would just leave ignorant of whatever the world teacher was saying before I'd raise my hand in class. But I was grateful for classmates that did raise their hands. And here the disciples go into the house and they're looking around and one of them says, hey, I got a a question. I need you to shed some light on what it was you just said because it sounded pretty profound. And look at verse 18. And he said to them, then you are also without understanding? I'm sorry, then are you also without understanding? He asked them a question. You don't understand. How do you not understand? And then he goes on to reiterate what he's already taught to the crowds. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And then he adds his tagline at the end. Thus he declared all foods clean. And so here in this text, even the disciples were struggling to understand Jesus' teaching on the heart and the law. And so Jesus explains it to them yet again. And what I love about this is it's great to see the patience of Jesus as his people act like knuckleheads again. And it's a reminder to us when we get legalism in our own hearts, when we begin to think that we can accomplish certain things by our own actions, Jesus faithfully and consistently reminds us and he's patient with us and he teaches us again and again. Just like he did the disciples, he consistently leads them to where they need to be in spite of their lack of understanding. The symbolism and cleansings that were prescribed to God's people in the book of Leviticus were like pictures in a picture book as a child learns how to read, all right? Dawson's in kindergarten, Dawson is is, is starting to read now, but early on, you're kind of going through the book and you're kind of showing him the pictures and he's more preoccupied with the pictures than he is what's actually written there. The book of Leviticus is similar. They were like symbols and images and shadows that all pointed to a greater spiritual reality. And so these ceremonies, these rituals, these different regulations then, they dealt with, with touching and eating and drinking They were simply external representations of the fact that God wanted a heart cleansing. These things were shadows pointing to something greater that was to come. And so the disciples then struggled to understand the parable that Jesus spoke of because they failed to see the larger picture of what the imagery in the Old Testament actually pointed to. The author of Hebrews says this in chapter 8, verses 3 through 7. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Listen to what he says in verse 5 though. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So those Old Testament rituals, those systems, they they were shadows. They were a copy of, of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And so the author of Hebrews is essentially saying the same thing Jesus says here. The author of Hebrews is telling us to abandon the shadows, to abandon the types, to abandon the pictures, 
to abandon the, the sacrifice of the Old Testament and to come to Christ because Christ is the substance of our faith. Paul says in first, or maybe 2 Corinthians 1 that all the promises of God find their yes in him. The Old Testament, the theme of the Old Testament is the same as the theme of the New Testament. It is all about Jesus. Sally Lloyd-Jones says that, that every story whispers his name. Preachers have said it for years. He's the hero of every story. And so we can let the shadow go because the substance came. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. You see, but it's hard to break away from deep-rooted traditional legalism that held the disciples captive for so long. I know it's difficult because I see God's people today clinging to some of that same type of legalism. If you struggle with legalism welling up within your own heart, I would encourage you to go read the book of Galatians because it is rich with freedom in Christ. Now listen, freedom in Christ doesn't give you a liberty to go do what you want whenever you want, however you want to do it. Freedom in Christ actually frees you to live in obedience to Christ. That's what freedom does. Listen, I want my children to obey me. If need be, out of fear and respect. But the goal is for obedience out of a genuine love. That's the goal. Same thing with us and our relationship with God. He desires obedience out of a love for him. You see, Jesus is radically reorienting his hearers from the external to the internal. The problem the Pharisees discovered is that the disciples did not wash their hands. And for most people, they see the problem as something that we do or don't do. But Jesus contradicts that worldview. The problem we have is not that we overindulge or that we fail at denying the flesh, but that our hearts are not treasuring Christ above all things. Because if you treasure Christ above all things, then everything else within your life will eventually fall into place. There is no such thing as sinless perfection for a believer, but you will grow and be sanctified. You see, what the people needed here was not a cleaning of their hands. What they desperately needed in this text was a cleansing of their hearts. Notice the statement at the end of verse 19. Thus he declared all foods clean. And so the Mosaic ceremonial laws then distinguish between clean and unclean foods. Again, the purpose was to instill an awareness of God's holiness and to highlight sin as a barrier to fellowship with God. And here Jesus just, in one statement, abolishes the dietary laws of the Old Testament. He just wipes it out. I read this this week, and for the first time in my life, I thought, you know, if he said that then, then why in the world did Peter struggle to take the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts? The same reason you and I struggle with obedience today, because we're hard-headed at times. And so Jesus declared all foods clean here. And the lesson is that we are numb to spiritual realities of the heart when we're consumed with food. We are numb to the spiritual realities of our heart when, we're, when, we're, when we are consumed with legalism. And the third lesson that we learn in the text is that our hearts are the source of all human corruption and only Jesus can give us a new heart. Let's move quickly because I'm running out of time. Verse 20 says, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Listen, if you don't get hit with some of the first few of those things, right? If you're like, well, I don't struggle with, with, with murder. I don't struggle with theft. I don't struggle with immorality. I don't struggle with adultery. I do not struggle with, with wickedness or deceit. Coveting is there. Envy, it's there. You say, well, I don't struggle with those things either. Well, then listen, let me tell you what that does mean. Pride is there, and if you can make that statement in your mind, then you definitely struggle with that. He hits everybody here from all ends of the spectrum. Spectrum. 
He said, all these things come from within, and they defile a person. You see, Jesus was teaching us that all foods were clean, and then in the very next verse, Jesus declares all hearts are dirty. All foods clean, all hearts dirty. You see, the human heart, apart from the grace of God, is capable of gross immorality. Apart from God's grace, every area of life is tainted with sin, and sin originates in our hearts. Now, people try to rationalize why this list is here. People will say things like, you know, what we really need is a better education system. Education will fix the problem. And then what you begin to see is education doesn't actually fix the problem. People just learn how to sin at different levels. They learn how to sin and take people's retirement accounts from them. They learn how to, how to work the stock market. They learn how to steal at a much greater level than a common thief who just breaks into your home and takes a few possessions. And so education can't be the root of the problem. People say, well, maybe it's environment. Maybe that's the root of the problem. Our inner cities, you know, uh, uh, there, there's this fatherlessness is just rampant in our inner cities. That's the problem. Is, fatherless, father, is fatherlessness a big deal in inner cities? Absolutely it is. But that's not the root of the problem. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's examples. Maybe it's negative examples. People see and people do. The examples had to come from somewhere. You see, they were, we have a tendency to deal with, with symptoms, not the root of the issue. Jesus in this text, church, is getting to the root of the issue. The Pharisees had the scripture, and yet the theology of man and sin, it was defective. And so as a result of that defective view of sin and man, they treated the symptoms of the problem rather than the problem itself. You see, dealing with symptoms while avoiding the root cause never ends well. They might have made the outside of the cup look clean, but the inside was all kinds of messy. My kids unload the dishwasher as part of their responsibility. This week, I went to get a coffee cup out of the cabinet, and the outside looked perfectly fine. I looked on the inside, I could see coffee stain in it. I said, hold on a second. So then I started looking at other things. Started looking at plates and bowls. My kids had unloaded a dirty dishwasher. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a clean person. I'm a sanitary person. I wanted to take every dish we had and just rewash all of it. But I did my best to go through one dish at a time, put it back in the dishwasher, and ran the dishwasher again and prayed to Jesus that I wasn't the one that grabbed the fork that somebody's mouth had been on. Okay? I don't want that. The reality for so many people today is they're fine with the outside looking clean. They're fine with that and the messiness inside. Jesus wants to deal with the issue of the heart. If somebody explodes on me, goes off on me, or something random, there's always a greater issue at hand. It's never, it's never just me, although sometimes it is me, but it's never just me. You come across somebody at work, and they're, 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 they're temper short, and they snap at you. To, there's probably a lot going on in their heart and life at that point in time. That's simply a, a symptom of something else that's going on in their heart. You see, the gospel is a radical message. And what the gospel says is not to clean yourself up in order to come to God. The gospel demands a new birth, a new heart. And Paul says that you become a new creation. You see, that is impossible apart from the work of Christ. But through Christ and his saving power, we can become new in him and so I want to encourage you today, if you've come to the doors and you've never repented of sin, you've never trusted in Jesus, stop trying to clean yourself up in order to come to Christ. You'll never be able to be accepted in his eyes apart from the blood of Jesus. Come to Jesus and he will clean you up. That's the message of the gospel. That's the, that's the, the idea of a new heart, a new life. You see, the point of Mark 7 is that those who tried the hardest, who did their absolute best, could not please God by their works. And when you and I focus on the outside, we do it to the neglect of the heart. No matter how many times you wash your hands on the outside, 
You cannot wash your heart from the inside. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Ezekiel goes on to say, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. David, a believer who had a heart that sought after God. David sinned grievously. And in Psalm 51, after he became a murderer and an adulterer, in Psalm 51, verse 10, he's praying to God. It's an incredible psalm. And he says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Saints, we can come in here every Sunday and we can talk about making disciples and doing all these things, impacting our community. But may we never forget that we do that as a reflection of a heart that has been transformed by the gospel. And so in closing, I've got three points of application. Number one, do not believe the lie that your outward performance makes you right before God. Some of you think, well, I know that truth. I've got that truth. Write it down anyway and remind yourself of it daily. Do not believe the lie that your outward performance makes you right before God. To think that way and to act that way puts Jesus on the same level as every religion in the world. Number two, come straight from the Proverbs. Not original to me. Keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. Saints, guard your hearts. If you don't, if you let it wander and wander and wander, I will assure you of this, it will create idols. It will run and cling to things, to lesser gods, and they will eventually destroy you. Number three, for unbelievers in the room, repent of sin and turn from the emptiness of your heart to a loving God who can transform your heart. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can trust it? Ignore the advice of people that say, follow your heart. That is a path to destruction. Ignore the people that say, the heart wants what it wants. Pathway to destruction. Repent of sin. Turn from the emptiness of your heart to a loving God who can give you a new heart. You see, what Jesus is teaching us is that we cannot avoid the problem because we are the problem. Politicians seek to address it. They try to address the symptoms while never looking at the internal problem of the heart. Listen, we can take ourselves as far away from the evils of society as we want. But that still will not fix the immorality and the idolatry of our hearts. I want you to know that Jesus did not die as an example for us. Jesus died to make atonement for our sins. Jesus died so that our hearts might be made new. For believers today, let's celebrate that. And for unbelievers today, I want to encourage you to repent of sin, trust in Christ, and give your heart to a loving God who can transform you from the inside out. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you that opportunity. Father, I love you, and I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would work through it in the life of your church during this time. God, I pray that we would all, God, not just look at the fruit of our life, but God, I pray that we would look at the condition of our hearts. God, that we would evaluate our hearts. God, to see if we've replaced you on the throne with anything else. And God, as we respond to the preaching of your word today, God, I pray that repentance would be taking place all throughout this room. God, I pray that believers would be turning from sin. God, I pray that brokenness would take place. 
God, I pray that you would stir our affections for you today. And God, I pray that those that are far from you would be brought near to the blood of Jesus. God, give them the courage to step out and to come to Christ through repentance and faith. God, we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me. Thank <laughs> you.